welcome back to Felony Spectator. I am your host, Heather. Before we begin, I want to let you all know that this will be the last video of 2023. I'm going to take the rest of December off, but I have lots of other videos I'm already working on for the new year. So if you don't want to miss those, please hit subscribe. Today, we're talking about the Ebby Stepik case. This is an unsolved case and also really frustrating. You'll see why. Let's get right into it. Ebby was born March 31st, 1997, and was the daughter of Lori Jernigan and Peter Stepik. Her parents got divorced, but they were both still very much a part of her life and loved her very much. Ebby primarily lived with her mom, Lori, stepdad, Michael, her sister, Harris, and older brother, Trevor, until Trevor moved out on his own. I believe Trevor was about 10 years older than Ebby. Family would refer to Ebby as Ebster or Ebjane, but the nickname they used the most was Ebby Jane. She was to graduate in 2016 and was also fond of learning new languages, studied Spanish and Turkish, as well as Hebrew with her grandma Debbie. She also had aspirations of being a real estate agent and a cosmetologist. Ebby's mom was a hairstylist and Ebby loved makeup, so her dream of being a cosmetologist seemed very natural. Ebby was also described as a bubbly teen. She was small at only a little over five feet tall and 110 pounds. Friends would say that she was fiercely loyal, always made them laugh, and if there was any turmoil, she always made sure to make amends. In the summer of 2015, life started to get a little difficult for Ebby. It's reported that she got a summer job at Foot Locker in 2015 and met a new group of friends. This new group of friends were quite different than her current group, and her mother thought a bad influence. I believe it was through this group that she met Eric, her new boyfriend and Eric wasn't someone her parents approved of. It said that he was very controlling and it's assumed he was also manipulative. According to family, he had so much influence on Ebby that she actually transferred out of Lisa Academy in her senior year, the charter school she had attended to her whole life. Instead, she wanted to go to the public school he attended, Central High. By most accounts, Ebby, her mom and her stepdad were not getting along. Ebby's mom also started to get phone calls that Ebby was missing a lot of school. This was all very out of character. Ebby had basically turned her life upside down and her parents didn't know what was going on. Despite their best efforts to tell her to go to school and make good choices, Ebby already had her mind made up that her boyfriend and her new friends were more important and she had things figured out. Ebby was also extremely stubborn, so when she made up her mind, there was no changing it. Lori eventually put her foot down. If she didn't start going to school regularly, she wasn't allowed to live under her roof. So Ebby moved out. Ebby first went to live with her dad, but she also stayed at friends' homes a lot too. Sometimes she stayed with her good friend Danielle or stayed at another friend, Kaylee. Occasionally she stayed with her grandparents and at her older brother Trevor's home. Kaylee would speak out later and say that Ebby did go to school and was being responsible while she was living with her. But Ebby's parents didn't see that. It wasn't that her parents didn't allow her to have freedom or make her own choices. It was more her behavior towards them, towards school, and the fact that she wanted to be with her boyfriend who they didn't approve of. From what I understand, Ebby also wasn't a sharer. Her close friends didn't even know what she was doing or where she was when they weren't together. She also kept her friend groups separate. Ebby had completely stopped talking to her mom as well, but she did try and keep a relationship with her brother. He was really the only person she thought she could trust. Ebby's mom, Lori, spoke out on the Helen Gone podcast and mentioned that Ebby recently confided in Trevor telling him that she was starting to get tired of how her life was going. She mentioned that she had seen a lot of things that she felt like she didn't need to see, and she was over it. She wanted to get her GED and get her life back on track. Now, we don't know what it is that she had seen, because remember, she wasn't one to elaborate, but whatever it was obviously bothered her to the point where she was done with where her life was going and she wanted a change. The week before she disappeared, she texted a good friend, Danielle, on October 20th and asked if she could spend the night. Of course, this wasn't an issue. They were good friends and Danielle and her mom were the type of people who always had the door open for Ebby. That night would turn into three nights of sleepovers. Danielle remembers that on October 21st, 2015, she messaged Ebby that she and her mom were running late from an early morning doctor's appointment. 
And if that meant that Ebby was late for school, then Ebby could go on without her. Ebby would reply that she didn't really want to go anyway because of, quote, all the drama, which confused Danielle because she didn't know what the drama was she was referring to. Danielle's mom told Ebby that she could make herself at home and eat whatever she wanted in the house. Ebby ended up skipping school that day. Ebby never told Danielle what was going on in her life that was causing the drama. Danielle was concerned, but there wasn't much she could do. When Friday, October 23rd came around, Ebby told Danielle that there was a party they should go to. Danielle declined because she didn't know anyone else who was going. It was one of Ebby's other group of friends. It also wasn't really her scene. Ebby was known to smoke plants and drink, and Danielle didn't. Ebby ended up going to this party anyways, leaving Danielle at home. The following day, during the day, Ebby returned to Danielle's house and informed her that she was going to go back to her brother's place for a while. She said something about him being worried about her, so she was going to go spend some time there. She gathered her clothes, makeup, but before leaving, the girls made plans to go to church Sunday night and also talked about an upcoming ice cream party that they were both excited about. Danielle had no idea that anything was wrong. Ebby seemed like her normal self. Ebby would then spend the afternoon at her grandparents' house. She spent most of the time lying in bed watching SpongeBob SquarePants and texting her friends. Ebby would stay there for dinner, and after dinner, her grandparents took her to TCBY for frozen yogurt. Her grandparents don't remember her acting strangely, but Ebby had been dealing with some issues. Something had happened to her at the party the night before. What has been widely reported in the media is that Ebby had texted her friends saying that four men had RAPE'd her the night before, and this incident was also recorded. What really happened is that it wasn't four men, and she originally implied in a text message that it was consensual, except for the recording. There also wasn't a party. She was with some friends at someone's house, a small group of friends from Central High. Based on a text message, it appears as though she did have a sexual encounter with one person, consensual, and that she thought this person recorded it without her consent. And this made her furious. It was in a message to her friend Gage saying, quote, I was hanging with some dudes last night and we smoked and I was having sex with one of them and he fucking recorded me, dude, like when I wasn't looking, end quote. After returning home from getting frozen yogurt with her grandparents, she decided that she needed to do something about what happened. She also wasn't the type of person to let things go. She was mad and wanted the person responsible to be punished. I think at this point, she was also questioning whether the sex was consensual as well, because her family later learned of a Google search showing how to know if you've been R-A-P-E-D. So Ebby messages her stepfather, Michael, and tells him what happened and that she wants to go to the police station and file a report. She also asks him to go with her for support. Michael was at a restaurant with Lori, her mother, so he informed Ebby that he would take her mom home after dinner and he'd come and get her. Now, I don't know if there was a miscommunication or Ebby changed her mind, but even though her stepdad said he was going to come get her, Ebby left her grandparents' home. She told them that she was going to meet up with her stepdad. She also told them she loved them and asked that they not lock the front door because she was going to be coming back and also wanted to spend the night. For clarification, yes, she told Danielle she was going to go to Trevor's, but Trevor and his girlfriend were out of town at a wedding and he didn't want her there alone. I think there was some trust issues. He was worried that she'd bring people home and they did have a bit of an argument about it, but in the end, she was supposed to stay at her grandparents. When Michael was done dinner, he called the grandparents home and asked where Ebby was because by this time, Ebby had stopped responding to his messages. They told him that Ebby went somewhere to meet up with him. Michael insists to this day that he was to meet Ebby at the grandparents' home. Ebby didn't return to her grandparents' house that night at all, even though she said she was going to come back and spend the night. Michael, her stepdad, said that Ebby was pretty upset about what happened at the party. So he suspected that Ebby was going to try and get the video. So he suspected that Ebby was going to go confront the boy about the video. Again, she was really angry. But at this point, nobody was super concerned. Nobody knew where she had slept Saturday night or who she was with. Then around 5.30 p.m., Trevor called Ebby again to find out where she was. Ebby still didn't answer, but a few minutes later, she called him back. This phone call shook him up. 
He immediately went over to Lori's, ran into the house saying that he thinks something is wrong with Ebby. Trevor would say that Ebby wasn't acting like her usual self and seemed panicked or that she was in a rush. She was talking really fast, almost like she was high or running on adrenaline. She wasn't slurring her words and sounded normal, just really rushed. When he asked where she was and explained that everyone was looking for her, she told him that she was parked outside his house. Trevor would walk out onto the street and Ebby's car was nowhere in sight. He called her back and asked Ebby again where she was. But now she said she wasn't actually sure where she was and she kept saying, I'm really fucked up. I don't know where I am. I'm fucked up. And the call would end there. From this point on, nobody could reach Ebby. She stopped answering her phone and again, wasn't returning her text messages. Her parents called, her sister called, and Ebby's friends were calling. Danielle also had no idea where Debbie was. Danielle was at the ice cream party that Ebby was supposed to go to. When Danielle learns that Ebby's missing, she helps the family by calling around to Ebby's friends that she knew to see if they knew where she was. Ebby's family called police to report her missing, but the police told them to wait at least 12 hours from when Trevor spoke to her last. Side note, there's no real rule when you can report a person missing. It's a misconception that you have to wait 12 or 24 hours. Police often encourage families to wait, but if something is really out of character or suspicious, a report can be made. Unfortunately, in Ebby's case, police listed her as a runaway and no formal search was conducted. Lori did take it upon herself to pass out flyers and they called everyone they knew, but the police didn't do much. Even to this day, her friends say they've never been contacted by police. Police informed Lori that they'd put out an all point bulletin out for Ebby's car and hopefully in locating Ebby's car, they would locate Ebby. On October 28th, it's reported that a security guard named Guy Hooper called police to report an abandoned car at Charlemont Park a playground in West Little Rock. The car was reported to be sitting in the parking lot next to the woods backed into a parking spot. It takes the police two more days before they investigate the car. When they finally take the time to investigate the car, they found the keys were still in the ignition, her phone and wallet were both still in the car, as well as her contact lenses, clothes, and makeup. The car battery was dead and the gas tank was empty. So her car had been left running when it was parked there. What is also interesting about this is that the incident report, which has been released, states that it was a neighbor named Lee who lived near the park that called it in, not Guy Hooper. Lee, this neighbor had called several times about the abandoned car and said it took days before police finally went to the park. I guess this park is a local hangout for teens. They go, they smoke, they hang out. It's a nuisance to the people who live there. Guy Hooper, who owns and operates ASSI Security, often patrolled Charlemont Park and the surrounding neighborhood. And this started to prevent theft. Catalytic converters were being stolen and a nearby construction site also had recent theft. So ASSI Security was just there to prevent crime, to be a presence. They were not there to enforce any laws. Guy claims that he ran into Ebby at that park a few times, and she was often with a black boy with dreads. Who was this? Eric doesn't remember there ever being security there at all, or any of the times he hung out in the park. So the security present wasn't constant. However, the week leading up to her disappearance, they were sort of fighting and they were not at the park together. Guy said Ebby's car was there Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, and then he called police. He also said he saw a purse in the car and personal items. Police never came to his calls. Wednesday night and Thursday night, the car was still there, but not there on the 30th. The car was gone. Guy's name isn't listed on the incident report though. It shows Lee, the neighbor, as being the person who made the calls. Why is there a discrepancy? We don't know. This case was featured on the Dr. Phil show. And even on the Dr. Phil show, Guy admits to seeing Ebby several times. Each time she was with this black male who had long dreadlocks. He then goes on to say that he looked like one of the men who had been arrested for trafficking. Police cleared these people because they were out of state at the time. But it's interesting that Guy is pointing the finger at someone else with no proof or evidence. Guy also claimed that he has a dash camera that records everything he does. 
this dash cam would have recorded all of the interactions he had with Ebby and all the times he patrolled when the car was still there. He apparently uploads the footage regularly to his computer. Strangely, when he went to download the footage that would have had Ebby in it, his computer was broken. He took his computer to his wife's IT guy and was told that his computer was fried. So Guy threw his computer in the trash. He never thought to get a second opinion and he never thought to ask the police if he could get someone to access the footage. He just threw it away. And this is really concerning because he potentially had footage from an active crime scene. Lee, the neighbor, said the car was backed into a spot that was sort of hidden from the main road. Lee said there was also a towel on the ground beside the rear wheels. The towel was more likely from inside Ebby's car and possibly from Trevor's home. Sadly, Trevor passed away from heart complications, so he can't give us any further information on this. The driver's side seat was also pushed all the way back. Now, Ebby was only five feet tall, so she never ever had the seat back. So did someone else back the car into the parking spot for her? Or was she taking a nap and was interrupted? The Helen Gone podcast tried to meet up with Guy Hooper to ask about the car and the incident report. He originally agreed to speak with the host and then ghosted them when the day came when he was supposed to meet them. I think he's staying pretty silent now, which is interesting. Now, even though Guy said it was him who found the car and regularly patrolled, it turns out he had other people working for him that regularly patrolled as well. The homeowners association of the neighborhood confirmed that there was two other guys who patrolled for him but the association didn't know who they were. ASSI security probably has that information, but it hasn't been released. Guy Hooper typically worked the evening shifts, so these other employees probably would have seen Ebby's car as well. But as far as we know, nobody else has been questioned. It has been confirmed that Guy's son, Josh Hooper, often patrolled with him. And Josh doesn't have the best reputation. One time, the security company had seen a robbery in progress. And I don't know what kind of robbery it was, but Josh chased this guy down and ended up shooting the suspect. And this was a big deal because everyone thought Josh was a hothead and used unnecessary force. His job was never to enforce the law. It was only to deter crime. A friend of Lori's also spoke out saying that she had an issue with Josh as well. Her son had made a teenage mistake by going to a pool after hours. He was a lifeguard and had a key to this pool. He used his key to let his friends in and they were all hanging out around the pool. The Hoopers caught them, made them get on their hands and knees, threatening to blow their heads off. It was a very scary experience for the teenagers. When the police came, they had to tell the Hoopers to calm down and thought the security guards blew everything out of proportion. And most people didn't like to complain about the Hoopers, mainly out of fear and retaliation. They were known hotheads. That's not to say they're guilty in anything, but maybe the police needed to question Josh or the security company a little further. When the police did come for Ebby's car, they called Peter Stepek because his name was also listed on the registration. When they called him, they they informed him that they found his car and didn't even connect that this was a car of a missing person. Now, even though Lori was told there was an all points bulletin put out for the car, this probably means that there wasn't. The police did take the car in for processing when Peter filled them in on what was going on with Ebby, but we don't know what information the police got out of the car. Fingerprints, hair, receipts, none of that has been released. Police then investigated the park. They walked around part of the wooded area and said that she was not there. From there, they didn't really do much. They listed her as a missing person, but there was also no formal search arranged to find Ebby. Ebby's family and friends would rally together and search the nearby woods again to try and locate Ebby. There was no reason for her car to be parked in this parking lot without her. And why was all of her belongings still in the car? Her mom knows that she would never have willingly walked away from all her personal belongings. And to be honest, what teenager would? Most teenage girls would never walk away from their phone or their makeup. It's bizarre why police didn't take her case a little more seriously. Then on November 3rd, Kaylee, Ebby's good friend, went back to the woods with her mom to look for Ebby. They ended up calling police to report a smell at the park near a manhole cover that connected with the drainage system, which they could only describe as the smell of decomposition. Allegedly, Kaylee's mom had to phone the police three or four times before anyone went down to investigate. 
When the police did go to Chalamont Park, they walked around, lifted the manhole cover, and dismissed the claims of decomposition and said it was probably just sewage that they were smelling. Out of frustration, Kaylee went back another time with a friend to see if they could open the manhole cover and investigate themselves. She remembers that the drain cover was extremely heavy. It was hard for Kaylee and her friend to move it together, so she could not believe that Ebby opened it all the way on her own. The ladder down was also tricky to maneuver, and the drain pipe was pretty small, so they didn't see anything, but she knew in her gut that something was wrong. Police finally handed over the case to the Violent Crimes Division, and surveillance footage along Cantrell Parkway in West Little Rock was reviewed. And it did show that Ebby drove by, but it appeared as though she was in her car alone. And this made police think that yes, Ebby took off somewhere alone and they didn't suspect foul play. Lori would then ask the police to look into Ebby's social media accounts. Maybe there was information that showed where Ebby was last. The police apparently didn't know how and told Lori that they didn't have the ability, which isn't true. Police simply need to get a warrant and subpoena the information from the social media sites. There is an application on Facebook that Lori copied and pasted to police, but they insisted that they weren't able to do that. Lori took it upon herself to hire her own IT person to hack the accounts. However, it did look like someone had already logged into her Facebook account before she did. They don't know who that was, but now they don't know if things were deleted. They saw that she had Google searched how to file a police report, and surprisingly, there was two outgoing phone calls to the Little Rock police station around 7.30 p.m. on October 25th. This was around the same time she left her grandparents' house and was texting with her stepdad. Now, the phone calls were only about a minute in length, and the Little Rock Police Department don't have record of these phone calls, so she must have hung up before they were connected. Or perhaps she was doubting herself, but the fact that she attempted to call police shows that she was concerned and she needed help. They also saw that Ebby had sent several Instagram messages to someone named Leo. She was asking for contact information to the person she had sex with on Friday, and she was threatening to call the police. Now he said no need to get the cops involved and he was trying to reassure her that he'd take care of it. After Saturday, there was no communication to any of the men from Friday night. It didn't appear as though she was gonna meet up with anyone on Sunday either. So they still don't know who she was with. There was information on Kaylee's phone. While Ebby was crashing at her house in the beginning of October, Kaylee and Ebby switched cell phones. Kaylee bought Ebby's iPhone 6 and gave Ebby her own iPhone 5. Somehow, Kaylee's Apple ID stayed connected to Ebby's iPhone 5. So Kaylee often got screenshots or pictures on her phone. There wasn't anything remarkably found, but screenshots of the messages she was sending regarding the recording Friday night. Some selfies, but nothing to show where she was. Police apparently took Ebby's iPhone 5, but we don't know if they were able to find anything else. The only thing we know for sure was that late Friday night, she did see Eric, and Eric admits this. Her and Eric were in a complicated relationship. It wasn't an open relationship, but they weren't exactly in a committed relationship either. Eric admits that Ebby heard that he had slept with someone else, so he suspects that Ebby was trying to get back at him, and that's why she was with this other man Friday night. He was unaware of any RAPE allegations or any recordings, but said Ebby was acting like something was on her mind. Lori was desperate and had emailed the chief of police, the mayor. She brought victim services to her meetings to take notes. She didn't understand why she wasn't getting anywhere with this investigation. The police warned her if she was gonna start digging around, not to touch anything or say anything. They weren't really happy with what Lori was doing and they eventually kicked her out of any meetings and threatened that they were gonna stop updating her at all. Lori felt like they wanted her to stop looking for her daughter. When Peter got Ebby's car back after it was processed by police, he also wanted to look through it and see if he could find anything. But a lot of her stuff, including the entire trunk of her car, had loads of water damage because the police had left the trunk open during a storm. Her stepfather took photos just in case, but everything was ruined, which was really disappointing. Unfortunately, from this point onwards, Ebby continued to stay a missing person. Nobody knew where she was. Sadly for Ebby's family, the police also continued to treat her case as if it wasn't urgent. They rarely returned phone calls and weren't communicating very well with her family, in their opinion. 
A private investigator would be hired named Monty, who was a retired police officer. He originally didn't want to get involved, but when he took a closer look, he realized that there was a lot of problems. Lori informed Monty that Ebby's phone could only make phone calls on Wi-Fi, so she often went to the Walmart parking lot, which was only about three minutes from the park where Ebby's car was found. Monty went to Walmart to ask about their security footage and was informed that it was long gone. They don't keep footage after several months. They also let him know that as far as they knew, the police never asked for this footage either. Monty then spoke with Gage, the person Ebby text messaged, revealing the man she had sex with, and Gage claims that he wasn't contacted by police either. Monty brought these concerns to the police and thought there was probable cause for police to speak with the man who allegedly recorded the sexual encounter and obtain his phone. Police said no. They did not believe there was any reason to ask for this man's phone. They had Ebby's and that's all they needed. Out of desperation, the family spoke out on the Dr. Phil show in December of 2017, telling the public that the Little Rock police are mishandling Ebby's case. The police didn't speak with key witnesses, didn't follow leads of the men who allegedly harmed her, and there was apparently the security footage from Walmart that might have shown what Ebby was doing or who she was with the night she disappeared. Unfortunately, nothing came of this episode. It wouldn't be until a few years later on May 22nd, 2018, when her skeletal remains were sadly found. Cold case investigators claimed they worked with Public Works to send robots with video cameras into the drainage hole because they had a hunch that this is where Ebby might be. Ebby's body would be found 70 feet inside a concrete drain. This is also the same drain that Ebby's car was parked in front of. Ebby was there the entire time. Police implied that Ebby might have taken her own life or that she crawled inside the pipe for some reason and got stuck. Now the details are sketchy, but to Ebby's family, there was no way she would take her own life. And who ends their life in that manner? Animals, maybe, crawling into small areas to die, but not humans. If she was hiding from someone or something, wouldn't she take her phone? Or drive away? From what I understand, the coroner conclusively ruled her death a homicide, but the cause of death is unknown. Now, I don't think the death certificate has been released, so we might not be able to take that as face value. The private investigator who Ebby's family hired also went down the pipe where Ebby was found just to see if it was possible that Ebby could have crawled in there alone. To them, it seemed inconceivable. She would have needed to remove a heavy manhole cover, then somehow slide the cover back over, climb down a ladder to go into this small drain pipe. When the private investigator went down to the pipe, they had to turn around and barely made it because it was so narrow. Yes, Ebby was only five feet tall and only 100 pounds, but it didn't seem possible that she could have wiggled herself so deep into this hole and she probably would have gotten stuck at the entrance. Now, I don't know if this makes a difference or not, but I also learned that it wasn't the cold case investigators who contacted the city to investigate the drain. Years later, someone had come out and said the neighborhood had been complaining nonstop for months and months regarding the drainage system. It was a constant issue because every time it rained, the drain would back up. A plumber had come out and said that there was a blockage deep inside the drain, but he couldn't get to the drain far enough to see what it was. It was the plumber who said that the city needed to be called because perhaps they had the equipment to go that far. Now, perhaps the police wanted to be involved just in case it was Ebby, but it wasn't them who initiated the cameras. Due to the length of time she was down in this drain, I don't believe they can test for drugs or any other substances. But there's the question that if Ebby had overdosed or something unintentionally bad happened to Ebby, how did she get down there? Now, most people would probably just run away. Good people would call 911, but if you're scared, you'd probably just run off. If she was robbed, her cell phone and purse would be gone. So it definitely seems as though someone wanted her hidden. They moved her car, they hid her body, and had knowledge of that drain pipe. Ebby did have bipolar disorder. She was prescribed two different medications. Ebby did have bipolar disorder as well. 
She was prescribed two different medications, so there's also the possibility that she was going through an episode of some sort. There is a small chance that she did hide down there, but again, wouldn't she take her phone? And why was her car backed into a spot left running? And why was the driver's seat pushed back? Ebby's case is still a cold case, but it's been left open. Police say there isn't anything else they can do, but for some reason, they won't officially close it. Since it's still open, Ebby's family is not allowed to have the files, which include the autopsy and death certificate. They can't have information found in Ebby's phone or anything. And this is obviously very frustrating because it's left them without answers. Perhaps the police are hopeful that this case is solvable, but it's definitely frustrating. My thoughts? I think when we're left with such little information, we tend to come up with all sorts of scenarios, which isn't good because now things are being reported incorrectly. And at the end of the day, it doesn't help solve the case. I think I'm like everyone else when I say I have no idea what happened. And I am just as confused as everyone else on how she got into that drain pipe. We do have to consider that she didn't crawl 70 feet into the pipe. After many storms and many years, her remains were probably pushed farther and farther into that pipe. It's just really too bad that police didn't take Kaylee's report on smelling decomposition more seriously. If they had, they would have found Ebby right away and they would have more answers to a lot of these questions. Or if police had actually looked in the pipe in the very beginning, they probably would have found her. I don't think she was very far in that pipe in the beginning. It would have been very hard to push dead weight, presuming she was already dead, and hidden her there. So she was probably right there, which is discouraging. I'm curious to know what everyone's thoughts are in this case. Do you think it was someone she knew? Did it have to do with the Friday incident where she was recorded? Or maybe the hot-headed security personnel had something to do with it. Was it strangers she ran into? Or was it a bipolar episode? I sure hope someone comes forward so her family can have some sort of closure. I feel like the answers are right there, but the pieces aren't fitting together because this case wasn't taken seriously for so long. What do you think? That's it for today. Thanks again for joining me here on Felony Spectator, and we will see you in 2024.